Hey friends, welcome back to the Big Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Trisha Brooke, founder of the Big Talk Academy, award-winning director, producer, and author, and this is episode 497. This week, I am so honored and excited to introduce you to Pam McKissick. Pam's colorful career includes high-profile stints at Walt Disney Studios, TV Guide Networks, and WNEW-FM, Metro Media New York. A woman of great character, ironic insight, intelligence, and creativity, Pam currently coaches C-suite executives whose career or life is at a standstill, motivating them to embrace change, unpack their power, and become more confident leaders. She is incredible, and I cannot wait for you to listen to this incredible conversation. Let's do this. Pam, I am so honored and excited to have you here with us on The Big Talk. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And the feeling is mutual. Uh, I can't wait to dive in. But before we do, will you take us a little bit into the backstory of how you came to be with us here today on the Big Talk podcast? Sure. Um, You know, I was a little girl raised in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma uh, in the 50s and 60s. So I've been at it 50 years. And my whole dream was to go to New York and become a Broadway star. So I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Uh, graduated, but after many auditions, I was told that if I could just wait 20 more years, I'd be a great character actress. And of course, when you're 20 years old, thinking of waiting till you're 40 is death. So an opportunity came up to audition for the uh, WNEW FM Metro Media Women's Radio, first time ever. And I auditioned, and phenomenally, I was hired. And those were the days in which uh, people forget you could not get a credit card without going with a man to the bank, even if he didn't have a job and you did. If you got pregnant, you had to give your work up. If you wanted a divorce, you had to convince everybody, including the Pope. And it was not a good time for women. But I was so happy to be in New York and to have this job. You know, I, I didn't care much about that. I was kind of oblivious to it. And that was the 60s. And in the 70s, I was working in a big ad agency in the Southeast. And um, I was a writer-producer, and my boss gave my cohort a huge bonus, and I got about half of that. And when I found out, I said, you know, what's up with that? Because you've told me I'm better than he is. And he said, yeah, I know, but that old cliche, he has five children to support and a wife, and you're single. And I said, well, so if he impregnates his wife five times, he gets more money, and if he gets her pregnant ten times, would there be an extra bonus for that? And of course, it wasn't popular, and I didn't get a bonus. And then in the 80s, I was with Disney, and as everybody knows, they have a huge dress code, and I love Disney, but men had no facial hair. Uh, That was the end of it. Women couldn't wear uh, textured hose, certain color hose. If there was a slit up your dress, they measured it. If your earrings were too big, they'd put a dime up to your ear and said, you know, too much. you got to go home. So I made that kind of a cause celeb, and not popularly, but I got people talking about it. Then by the time I'm in the 90s, you know, I'm still not very vocal, but I was running a large company, and I happened to be on a conference call that I wasn't expected to join, and a few of my employees were talking about um, a particular restaurant in town and how they pushed away homosexuals and how funny that was and how good it was. So I just simply said, "Um, gentlemen, this is an interesting, interesting conversation you're having. And uh, they said, I'm sorry, who's, who's talking? And I said, the lesbian who signed your paychecks. So that's ba- about the time my voice came out. And it took decades for me to have the courage to be forthright and direct. And of course, it's improved my life enormously. I love that you're talking about how you literally had a job that was using your voice on radio. And yes. simultaneously, you were not using your voice. Absolutely. How, when you think about the courage that it took and the breaking point, if you will, <clears throat> for everyone who's listening, what was that for you? And what can you share with our audience about how to fully step into using their voice and why it's important? You know, you can't live a bifurcated life. You can't be one person at home and another person at work or at church or whatever. And you're only as sick as your secrets. So it is very important to own who you are, regardless of 
where you are. You have to own who you are to integrate that person that you are. If you're not integrated, you can't share anything meaningful with anyone, therefore you can't help them. For example, if you uh, aren't going to say that you're gay, then you can't ever say, oh, I had a terrible weekend, my mate is sick, and we had to take her to the hospital. You know, you can't say, oh, my in-laws threw us out because they're a right-wing, you know, Christian. You have to be a blank slate. And because of the blank slate, people presume you have no life. And that's why they ask you to take care of their seven cats and two children while they go on vacation because, you know, you don't, you don't have anything else to do. When you think about having a life and sharing your life and being so honest and authentic with your truth and using your voice, what would you say to those out there who are afraid and who would rather have a blank slate? What's the worst that can happen? The truth is it's already happening and you know it. You know people are talking behind your back and saying, well, you know she's gay, but they don't talk about it. Or you know he's X and they don't talk about it. They're already doing that. You cannot stop anyone from saying anything, good or bad, about you. It's not about them. It's about you. What do you want to say about you? That's the critical piece. I love that so much, Pam. You are an ac- advocate and an activist and an author of a book called Grab It Back, as well as this gorgeous website called Boss Mare Art. And you ferociously and courageously share your truth every day in everything you do. Can you share with me right now and with our audience right now how you feel now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned in this time and what we need to be doing about it? I think it is one of the most frightening things that has happened to women. Um, I equate it to what's happening in the uprising in Iran where the women are taking back their power, burning their traditional garb and saying, you know, I want to go back to being a woman like I was in the 60s before, you know, we had the leadership we have now. We call ourselves a democracy. We are no longer a democracy. When women do not have control of their own bodies and cannot say what we want to do, that we're not mentally ready, physically ready, uh, we don't want this child. We were raped by a relative. We were hit in the mall by some crazy guy. Uh, if we can't own that and, and say what we want to do with our bodies, we have no democracy. So stop kidding ourselves. Men say we have a democracy because it works for them. And I'm not, people say, oh, you know, you're a lesbian, you hate men. That's not true. I hate the behavior The way I look at it, the last time I checked, there's more adult women in the United States than there are adult men. Adult women raise boys to men. If that's true, why do those boys that were raised to men turn on the women and try to control them and legislate against them? It must be something in the way we're raising them. And that makes women just nuts because they love their sons and they don't want to talk about that. But there's a study that says little girls and little boys up until the age of six years old believe they're equal. And then suddenly, after six, little girls are saying the little boy is smarter. And we say, oh, I didn't raise my boy differently. Do you know that 70% more often we Google, is my daughter fat, than we Google, is my son fat? Why do we care about that? Because she's going to be owned by somebody who's going to think she's pretty right? Or attractive or educated or whatever. I'm going on and on, but I mean, it just, it just makes me nuts. I (laughs) love that you're going on. I love that you're going on and on. And and I think I would like for us to continue going on and on because this is such an important topic and one that must be discussed. And that is women's rights and equality. When we think about how we show up as mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, partners, spouses, equals. What are we doing that is contributing to this? And what can we do to become part of the solution about equality? And you've heard me talk about this. I know you listen to the podcast, but I, yes. I, I've i talked about the reality that in Missouri, the state that I am from, equal rights still has not been ratified. Right. I mean, yeah. that's one of many of the states that it has not been. But right. what is what 
WTF, Pam. <laughs> yeah, WTF is right. Well, what we don't want to mention and, and we deny as women uh, is that we are great traders. You know, owning your power is very, uh, you have to be vigilant and it takes energy. Being praised um, feels good and doesn't require as much. So if a man or a female mate comes along and says, I have a lot of money and I'm going to take care of you, we will trade something for that, right? We will trade our independence. Uh, we will, if, if they protect us physically, we'll trade uh, control. They can have control of us. And you say, how does that connect? Well, if I'm really protecting you physically, I get to tell you, uh, I don't want you to go there because that's not safe for you. I don't want you to do that because that doesn't look good. We're, we trade off. And then we kind of park that. I call parking our power. And, and just move on. The thing that we have to do is recognize every time in these little moments that we are giving up our power. And that's what the book you mentioned is about. I think it annoys some women because it's so uh, rudimentary. It's not like I'm telling you to go picket in the streets and you know, uh, go see your congressman, all that's good. I'm simply saying, look at what you do every day in your life at home. How do you let people talk to you? How do you let your mate talk to you? How do you let your organization shame you? You know, There's all these elements that we kind of, it ticks with us and then we say, oh yeah, okay, now well, I've got to get on with my life and you ignore it. I think that's a really good word that you just chose to use, the word ignore. When we ignore inequality, we contribute to it. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and that is so important for our audience, for our listeners. If you are ignoring those microaggressions, you are contributing to the inequality and you are not making it any better for our future children men and women, girls and boys, because That's it's right. contributing to the boys thinking it's okay as well. I, I want to know at what point when you were in the industry, because you were in a male-dominated industry, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's still male-dominated. I experienced yeah. it as well in terms of showbiz and radio and television. Yeah. How did you um, feel when you said that statement at the dinner table well, I'm the lesbian who's writing your paychecks. How did that feel and what was the response there? Well, of course, I was saying it to people who worked for me and the response was just gulp. And then I got a call <laughs> back later and, you know, many apologies and uh, didn't mean it that way. And uh, all the things that probably are true to some degree, we all say things off the cuff, myself included, and we don't truly mean it in our heart. Uh, but the other piece of it is, and I got caught. You know, the guys are have gotten caught. They're being called out. And one of the dangers, particularly when I was starting out in the 60s, there weren't that many women. So if you didn't play like a guy, you were, probably weren't going to be at the table very often. So you learn to not talk about other women. If you were asked if there were a glass ceiling, I don't know. You know, I haven't experienced that. That was just BS because none of the men in the room wanted to hear about your glass ceiling problem. They felt you were doing fine just being in a seat with them. So it, it's, um, it's still going on. I think that's why I'm so frustrated because we went through such horrors to get where we are, to gain the tiny things we've gained. And in just not paying attention for a couple of decades has now brought us to the point where we've lost even what we had before. I think what you're saying is so poignant is the not paying attention. Yeah. And that goes for men as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a women's issue. Right. <laughs> I no. think that this is a, a human rights issue. And it's really, really important for our, our allies, our men, our, our boys to also be vigilant in this conversation about what is appropriate when it comes to women's bodies and women's rights. How do you feel about that? And when we come together, is this when our collective voices can make change for the good? Yes. I think um, 
men, we like to pretend sometimes that men are oblivious. We let them off with that, right? Oh, they just don't think like that. They don't think like a woman, blah, blah, blah. The truth is, when it works for you, and I would be the same way if I were a guy, why would I want to change? Well, just like the women of Iceland who put the whole country on strike, you know, in the 70s, I think, nobody went to work. They didn't do daycare. They didn't go to the banks. They didn't go to the restaurants. They didn't, I mean, they did not show up. Men were taking care of the babies at their offices. It only took a very short time for the men to go, okay, I think we ought to kind of address the whole equality thing because I don't want to be babysitting anymore. And that's the power of women banding together. Yes, it's risky. I mean, look at Iran. Those young women, I'm so proud of them. My God, you know, some of them are being killed. It's awful. But what's the alternative? More degradation, you know, more enslavement in essence. Being killed because you had on a headscarf, but it wasn't really covering enough, so we have to kill you. But you, if you, you know, if you go back, this is what gets me historically. If you want to talk about how far back it goes, in 327 BC, and I am no historian, but this just stuck with me. They were practicing sati, right, the ritual killing of women when their husbands died, because there would be no one to take care of them. So they had to kill the wife and bury her with the husband because there would be men who would rape her or torture her if, they, if she were left alone without a protective mate. Now, when you think about that, I mean, that is such a male solution. <laughs> I cannot, I have, cannot protect you. I'll be dead. So I'm going to have to have you killed so you'll be safe. I'm, and, and that went on in our society or a society, for a long time. And you go all the way down to the witch trials, right? In the 1400s, it began for 300 years, and 9 million women were murdered. They were the prettier, smarter, wealthier women. They were folks like us. We're like a coven, I guess, now. And they were murdered. And the church was involved. You know, it wasn't just like marauders. So when you have this in your DNA, since as long back as you can read about it isn't an odd thing that when we come to today, we, are, we have turned self-doubt into an art form, and we are constantly looking for someone to save us. My jaw is dropped open, and uh, I just remind our audience and our listeners that this is called the big talk, not the small talk. <laughs> so we are, <laughs> we are going there today. When you talk about our DNA, Pam, do you mean culturally, or do you literally mean the epigenetics I really mean the epigenetics because they started out doing research with mice, right? And if you came back generations and they experienced something negative, the mice would remember that. And as the next generation, next generation, they would pattern their behavior based on what the ancestors had experienced. So <clears throat> if we pass on our DNA at the cellular level, whatever happened to those cells is going to be part of us, whether we know it or not. And just from a common sense perspective, you know, we, we women talk so badly about ourselves. I, I, you know, just, I do it too. I mean, you go in the bathroom in the morning, you don't look great. And you say, oh, you know, I've got to lose 10 pounds. I need a facelift. You know, my one eye is lower than my other eye. Oh my God. You know, what am I going to do? What am I? We never go in and say, you look phenomenal. You are so powerful. I am so proud of you. You're going to be better and smarter and more beautiful every single day. Now, I connect that back to Emoto, the Japanese researcher who talked about the polluted water and he was able to make it into clean water and drink it by talking to it kindly, by speaking to it, uh, by singing to it. We're 60% water in the human body. So if you want to change how you are, Talk better to yourself. Quit saying, oh, I'm so dumb. Oh, I'm just, I wish I were more talented. We do it automatically. Oh, this is so good. For everyone who's listening, we want you to look in the mirror today and say, you're amazing. You're perfect. You're powerful. You're smart. All the things. That is something that we can literally do today to start changing the DNA of women in this world. It seems so simple, yet so difficult for everyone to actually do. I know. Do you know that only 4% of 
of the women in the world think they're beautiful? 4%. Oh, my God. I mean, I walk down the street, I think, and I'm a lesbian, but, you know, I go down the street and I say, she's beautiful. Oh, she looks lovely. Oh, whatever. You know, 4% of us look in the mirror and go, wow, I look good. Well, that can change today if everybody makes a commitment to us that you're going to start telling yourself you're beautiful. And I'm with you. I walk down the street and I see so many beautiful women. And my husband's always saying, you think everyone is beautiful. And I'm like, I do. <laughs> I mean, look at them. They're all unique in their own beautiful way. Exactly. And that's, that is what is so important as well, is that we need to come together collectively and be on the side of love the side of humanity. It's not the good or bad side, the right or wrong side. It's the side of how do we elevate humanity collectively? Would you agree, Pam? Absolutely. We should take a page out of Lizzo's book. I mean, I watched her the other night with, you know, in the Library of Congress playing the glass flute in that outfit. And I'm like, whoa, that is so phenomenal. She had the courage to wear that, make no comment about that, go play her flute. And I was like, you go girl. That is unbelievable. I would have been have in the to... mirror going, you know, I don't know. How do I look? What do you think? I need to get, you know. <laughs> how, what does she wear? I haven't seen it yet. It's like, you have to see it. It's inexplicable. It, it's like a see-through bathing suit with arms. I mean, it, you, it's just amazing that she would come out in that. And yet there's something about her that is so, I'm good, I'm okay, you know, I look wonderful, I'm talented, that you just go, you deserve every inch of that outfit. I love that. And you're touching on something that I think is important as well, which is, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. No. Do you know, we have, we were born these little bundles and we know nothing right, except our ancestral DNA, but, but we know nothing. And little by little, in a kindly way, most parents begin to put us in that box, you know, and I be careful what you say. You don't want to offend her. Don't do that in public. Don't, I'm not saying you don't manage your children, to teach them. But, you know, I was raised by military people uh, who were in the reddest state in the planet, you know, and were Baptists. Okay, you can imagine my box went, if I hit my microphone one time, you'd probably throw me out. But, you know, it's just that, that sense that you're so careful that as you become an adult and want to reach out, you have layers to peel off yourself, which took me decades to do. That's something, too, is that if we allow ourselves to be put in those boxes, it takes twice as much force and momentum to get out of them. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. Pam, I went to a women's college in Columbia, Missouri called Stevens College. And I know it. Did, yeah, it's, I had the most amazing time there. Um, and I had a big voice. I had a big presence. And I moved to New York City and had no idea what sexism was <laughs> because I never experienced it. And the first time I experienced it in New York as a waitress from my boss, I thought, What's that? So I think my naivete in many ways served me. What would you say to the young women out there now who are leading their lives from a place of absolute equality and beautiful naivete so that they can be empowered in the world? I feel like young women don't read enough I don't mean in general. They don't read enough politically. I certainly didn't. They don't stay in tune with what's going on globally. Their lives are jam-packed. I mean, when you're very young, you care about, are, am I going to make enough money? Am I going to meet the love of my life? I mean, it's, you know, are my parents going to get off my back? Are they, you know, you're all these things. The last thing you think about is what's happening in Bangladesh, right? But if we don't start thinking about the rest of the globe, we're soon going to realize the impact of that. The, the idea that we are hitting a little, what is it, an asteroid named Didymus with a you know, rocket 
to move it. That's a wonderful thing. But that's also the beginning of space wars. And the male solution, mostly male solution, for keeping asteroids from hitting us is finally step number three has to be the nuclear blast that breaks the asteroid up which they admit, you know, it will make thousands of miles of debris field and they'll all be radioactive, but blah, blah, blah. Women who come to the party, women always have a backup plan. We're built that way. Men don't, men don't, don't, don't worry about that because we'll get that, if that happens, it's not, it'll never happen, but if it happens, we'll take care of it. Women do not do anything but backup plans because what we say is uh, to our kid when he misses the bus, what do we say? Well, I guess he'll be there all night, but I'm not going to worry about it because, you know, it's not going to happen. We write his phone number on his hand. We tattoo our name on his arm. We're, he's got a cell phone so we can reach him, you know. We need women becoming part of all these big solutions, big projects. Men don't like that because it's a buzzkill, but we need that. There would probably not have been a Fukushima had that occurred. Um, you know, this whole outer space thing, we've got to get more women involved in that. That means they've got to be educated. They've got to step up. They've got to think beyond themselves. They've got to not look at their navel, and they've got to look out at what's coming. So powerful. And I think the other part of that is they need to acknowledge that it's possible for them. Absolutely. And, and thank God now that has just about begun to happen. And, and now what's frightening our legislators is it's just about to happen. And they're going, we've got to put a stop to this. There are more women graduating from college than men now. There are more women taking big positions in the field. We've got to do something about that. We've got to convince women to come home and have children again. Uh, oh, preferably white babies. We need more of that. So it's all this fear-mongering around women's power that I see. And I think there are very kind, educated men who are on our side. But there's that whole... I call them MAGA Republican, you know, right wing crazy QAnon thing that's very dangerous. I know that you talked about that in a podcast that I was listening to, uh, that whole like underground um, movement to silence women. That's really, really scary. Yeah, it is. Um, there's a lot of little groups we think, we hear about the Proud Boys, you know, and Oath Keepers, and they certainly are a problem. But the incels, the involuntarily celibate, are a whole new genre of, I, I call it mental illness. These are men who believe they can't have sex with women because women hate them. Well, they don't look at themselves and say, you know, why is my behavior or the way I look and I'm not clean? that women would reject them for that. And so they've gotten together as a group and they have uh, websites and they trade information with each other and it's gotten to the point where they're saying, I'd like to take so-and-so and rape her until she dies. And all the men come on and talk about that and excited about that. And you can go, oh, well, that's just you know the fringe. Well, we've already seen how the fringe moved in on us to our current day. These guys, there's thousands of them. And that's a concern to me. What would you suggest that we do in terms of our rights and our voices, Pam? I think we have to be, get off the curb and participate, particularly the young women who can march and move and you know do what they're doing in Iran. I'm, I'm not advocating violence, but if this continues, there will be something happening in the streets. If we have Supreme Court justices who no longer look at what's right by law, but are very partisan and moving an agenda forward that is against women, there'll be no turning back. Women will have to stand up and fight. Well, I stand up with you, Pam. I know you do. What an incredible conversation, one that I would love to keep having. And I also want to get to Fast Talk. Are you ready? Oh, okay. Ready. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite book? I don't have a favorite, but I did enjoy A City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. Amazing. Who's your favorite speaker and why? Uh, speaker and poet, uh, Maya Angelou. 
Mm. I think Maya Angelou had a sub subtle sexiness about her. Have you ever heard her read Jump Back, Baby, Jump Back? I really I've loved heard her. her read many things. Yeah, yeah. she's amazing. Um, how do you memorize if you're giving a big talk? Huh. Okay, I go through and I write the whole thing out first, like a script. Then I go back and I take it all down to key phrases. Then I go back and I take it down to key words. Then I put the key words on a tiny pad and I only take them with me in case I get distracted or lost or something because by then I should actually know what I'm talking about and I try to make it uh, as spontaneous as possible. Amazing. That is the best advice, everyone. Please take that and use it. What do you do the day before you speak, whether it's on stage or on a podcast like this? I fret um, and then <laughs> I, <laughs> I remind myself uh, that it's not about me. Stop worrying about how you look, how you sound, how you, it's about the idea that you have that you want to share. And it's about hoping that someone out there gets one thing that they can use that makes their day better. That's all I care about. Beautiful. And what podcast are you currently obsessed with? Well, you know, I'm not obsessed with any, unfortunately, but I started listening to Rachel Maddow because I like her. Uh, the problem for me is her show was very exciting and fast paced and funny. The podcast, she's either directed herself or someone has directed her to slow way down and tell it like an old radio broadcast. So I still love it because it's interesting information and it's historical, but I'd like the other style. Mm, that's good feedback. Rachel, if you're listening, take that feedback. It's meant with love. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for being a featured guest today on The Big Talk, Pam. Where can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, they can contact me at uh, Pam. Oh, actually, the best way is uh, mckgre18 at gmail.com. Amazing. Be very respectful with that email, everyone. Thank you so much for dropping in with us today and being an incredible listener and audience member for the Big Talk podcast. Your time is very precious and valuable. We know how much it takes to spend with us. We appreciate you. And remember, your voice matters. Big love, everybody.